thank you all so much for joining us this evening um, for our Historic Neighborhoods of Indianapolis series. I'm Liz Ellis. I'm the Executive Director here at the Indianapolis Propylium. The Propylium was founded in 1888 by renowned suffragist and activist May Wright Sewell as a place where women and women's groups could meet and share ideas. We carry on that tradition today through our mission as the place that connects and celebrates women. Our mission focus is women's leadership, arts and culture, and historic preservation. As a nonprofit, we count on your support to provide engaging programming like tonight. Please take a look at our website, www.thepropyleum.org for all of our upcoming virtual events and to support the Propyleum. We hope that you will join us at the Propyleum when we're all able to get together again in person. Um, our program tonight is Indianapolis's Lost African-American Architecture in Neighborhoods Then and Gone with Paula Brooks. Paula grew up in Indy's near West Side in what's now Ransom Place, an Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission Conservation District. A proud product of Indianapolis Public Schools and Howard University grad, Paula is a voice for Indy's Black history and culture and an activist for preservation of what remains. Paula will share some of her favorite buildings and forgotten neighborhoods that have been lost or significantly altered and suggestions for how Indiana Avenue should be revived. Ladies and gentlemen, Paula Brooks. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm excited and happy um, to be able to show um, and share um, just a few of my favorite buildings and memories and people. Um, unfortunately, I had to um, cut out um, several um, of my favorites just um, because of time but I'm happy to be here. So um, this first slide, that, um, this title slide here, this is actually a shot of the Ransom Place Pocket Park that's located at Camp in St. Clair. And this park um, was done in conjunction with the KIB Green Spaces Program. Um, we wanted to have, um, we, we actually owned a, a small half lot, um, the Neighborhood Association did, and we wanted to have some kind of commemoration um, for the history of the neighborhood, um, just given um, um, what time does to memories. Um, so this particular picture is a favorite of mine. It's um, obviously it's in the summer. Um, we have um, a picture of um, people um, waiting at the sunset and supposedly um, they're waiting for Duke Ellington. Um, this photo um, is from the Historical Society. And um, before I get started, um, I just really wanna um, thank um, Sharon um, Freeland and Joan Hosteller and Kasia Tanley and Marjorie um, Kenley for um, their help um, with this presentation. I don't think I would have been able to do it without them. Um, before I get started, um, I wanted to share a map um, of the various neighborhoods that I'm going to um, cover today. Um, the first one is Colored Town, and this neighborhood was actually um, established in 1830. Two, 33, 34, depending on um, your source. Um, but it was um, aptly named. It was the area where um, Black people um, lived um, in Indianapolis, north and west of downtown. And um, the area, um, Color Town, was just not Black people. It was also immigrants, um, mainly Irish immigrants, um, Greek immigrants and Italian immigrants. The neighborhood at that time stretched um, from about where the state office building is now um, up to about Walnut or St. Clair um, Street uh, along the canal. Um, there were railroad tracks that actually um, dissected um, the area and um, those railroad tracks were um, kind of um, thought of as a um, demarcation um, from downtown and in the um, neighborhood. Um, the second neighborhood is Pat Ward's Bottoms. And that neighborhood is was actually along Fall Creek um, at 10th and Indiana Avenue um, stretching. It actually 
stretched up um, to Bursal. Actually, um, people lived all along Fall Creek um, up until about the mid-century of the um, the mid-century twenty mid twentieth century um, when um, flood control measures were instituted. Um, and people were um, displaced. Um, but actually for Pat Ward's Bottoms um, today, um, the neighborhood of Flanner House Homes occupies that area. Um, so it would be um, from 10th Street to 16th Street from Fall Creek Parkway East Drive to MLK. Um, the third neighborhood is Martindale Brightwood and Martindale Brightwood um, is actually a, a very old neighborhood. Um, I, if you notice, I have Martindale here because Martindale Brightwood was actually two neighborhoods um, and they merged. Um, Brightwood was the, the white portion and Martindale Brightwood, uh, Martindale was the black portion. Um, Andrew J. Brown um, was about the boundary. Um, so the majority of black people lived east of Andrew J. Brown and then um, Brightwood, um, the white people lived um, to the, um, I said that wrong, the black people lived to the west and the white people lived to the east of Andrew J. Brown. And um, the third neighborhood the, or the fourth neighborhood is Boulevard Place. And um, I'm not sure if that's the actual name of the neighborhood, but when I was growing up, we always just called it Boulevard Place. And this is basically where Methodist Hospital is now. Um, as you all probably know, um, housing um, for Black people in Indianapolis historically has not been easy um, due to redlining, um, segregation, um, affordability. Um, and Boulevard Place was one of the first places that Black people actually moved to from the Indiana Avenue area. Um, Norwood um, is on the southeast side of town. Um, it's part of the um, southeast neighborhood. Um, when, not Windsor Park, um, Twin Air um, in that area um, near um, Shelby, Minnesota, Randolph, Keystone in that area. And it was always mixed over there, but there were um, black settlements um, starting at the turn of the century um, when it was rural. Um, and it's an area that um, does not get a lot of love at all. And then there's Barrington and Barrington um, is a uh, in that area, it's actually on Minnesota and Keystone and Barrington. Um, it was in the um, late 50s, um, a housing development was built um, in Barrington and at that time it was state of the art. So the near west side neighborhoods are Colortown, Bucktown and Boulevard Place. Um, right at Indiana Avenue and MLK or West Street, um, there's a historical sign and I'm sure um, most people don't see it because it's just right on the side of the, the sidewalk. And um, given um, the fact that West Street at that portion is, is basically a interstate um, access roadway, um, you, it's easy to drive um, right past it. But James Overhaul, he, in, in a lot of ways, um, I feel like he's, he's, he's my kindred spirit. He um, was a free man. He came to Indiana. He um, bought land in Corden. Um, he was um, wealthy. Um, he ended up coming to Indianapolis and he bought land along the canal, he actually bought um, the donation properties and those donation properties were um, Native American properties that have been, um, however you want to put it, signed away, seized, and then resold. 
um, he um, was able to um, make a lot of money um, speculating on real estate. Um, he also sold property to other black people. So in the early 1800s, it was not illegal for black people to own property um, but Black people did not have the right to vote, um, did not have full rights, um, criminal justice rights, and, and those types of things, access to education. But in Indiana, you could buy land. And I, I believe um, today, um, just the, the, um, the, 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 because in Indiana, you can, um, there, there's a doctrine, um, that um, you can build what you want on your land. Um, I believe that that really stems back from the early 1800s, um, given the fact that a free black person was able to amass a lot of land um, in, in Indianapolis. But the reason that I say that James Overhaul is um, kind of my hero or my kindred spirit is, is that, um, when the National Road was being built, there were um, laborers that came through and, you know, um, they were um, a lively bunch to put it mildly. Um, he, uh, there was this man that um, decided that he wanted to um, break into Mr. Overhaul's house. Mr. Overhaul shot him um, and, um, that that was um, a big, huge thing um, in 1831. Um, that um, a black man shot a white man. Fortunately, the man did not die. Um, James Overhaul was um, charged with um, assault, and um, he went to court. And um, Calvin Fletcher. He was friends with Calvin Fletcher. Calvin Fletcher wrote a letter in his defense um, in court. Um, the, um, Mr. Overhaul decided not to press any more charges because he was you know, kind of afraid of what would happen. But the judge ended up ruling that um, Mr. Overhaul had the right to sue um, in court and the right to defend his family. So um, he affirmed Overhaul's natural rights. And this was huge um, for Black people um, in the early 1830s. Um, Mr. Overhaul also was a, um, a, a patron um, of the Underground Railroad. Um, he would, um, people would, um, Cross over the Ohio River, and um, during um, before the Civil War, um, you had the um, Fugitive Act, which meant that um, a person um, who, even though you were in the North, um, the person that um, I, I really don't like to use the word "own," but that's what it was, um, could come and get you. Um, and um, Miss Overhaul actually um, saved a lot of people. Um, he um, would feed them, give them money. Um, there were safe houses all along the way. Um, people headed north to Canada or up to New York or Michigan. So um, Mr. Overhaul, um, I would really say that he um, kind of exemplify um, what um, the country is going through now in terms of the racial reckoning, he actually um, walked the talk. Um, he um, invested his money and he saved people. And for that, um, I just hold him in very high regard. Unfortunately, there aren't any pictures of him. Um, I wanted to highlight um, the um, Second Baptist Church, which is at, at um, West Michigan and um, in, um, West Street. Um, this church um, was the second black church um, established here in Indiana in um, 1867. 
at its heyday, it had over a thousand members. Um, the building is on the National Register of Historic Places. And um, the, the church now is um, located on Kessler and um, 30th Street, um, Pastor Green, Purpose of Life Ministries. Um, that's um, Second Baptist Church. Now, um, when I was looking at these pictures, um, I, I was not living here at the time when this building was renovated, so I don't know anything about the decisions that were made, but the building, um, as you can see, it's almost unrecognizable um, from its inception um, till its present um, um, or, um, incarnation, I guess I could say. Um, the building just recently um, was um, on auction and I'm not sure who owns it and I'm not sure what the new owner um, has plans for it, but my hope is, is that this building can actually um, become um, more part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, people, again, it's on um, MLK on West Street, you just drive right past it and, and you really don't see it. But um, this building um, is, um, 180 years old. Um, Pat Ward's bottom um, neighborhood, again, is at 10th and Indiana Avenue. And um, this neighborhood um, was um, home to people who basically had nowhere else to go. Um, I find it interesting, um, historically, um, any time that um, powers that be um, want to reclaim land, um, they'll say, oh, well, it's slums and um, you know, people um, should not be living in, in that area. But Pat Ward's Bottoms, because of the fact that it was um, a neighborhood that um, was very diverse, um, the closer you were to Fall Creek, um, the homes were more um, um, basic. Um, I, I hate to call them shacks, but um, they were just wood um, frame, very simple homes with no plumbing. But as you go east, the homes became um, bigger and more grand. Um, this is a picture of um, at Ward's Bottoms again. This is the West Side Shopping Center where the city barbecue is located. Um, the photo on the left, those are the homes that were torn down um, for the shopping center. And this shopping center was part of um, the um, Indianapolis Street Development Commission um, 1947, um, Project A. Um, so these homes were torn down um, for this shopping center. And what really struck me about these photos is um, the trees that you see um, all along um, in the horizon. Um, if you're familiar with the neighborhood now, um, you know that we don't have too many trees. And as you can see, these homes were substantial. They could be homes that are now located um, in, on New Jersey and here in Morton or on the old north side. This is a picture of the shopping center as it is today. So this, we had homes and now we have asphalt. Um, and I think that that's the story of Pat. Ward's Bottoms, um, the urban development schemes um, did not necessarily um, improve the um, quality of life for um, the, the people in the neighborhood. Um, this is the 1000 block of MLK. Um, this block, I'd like to call this block the block from hell or um, stepchild block and and the reason that I do that is is because it's um a very historic block um that no one knows about again you just drive right past it um 
you just see three wood frame houses in various um, conditions. Um, and you see a, a three-story brick apartment building. But what you don't know about these homes in this block is, is that um, Henry Fleming and Carrie Jacobs, Henry Fleming um, lived in the brown house on the corner. He was a businessman. He was a political operative. Um, so he was really like a big man around town. He also was a caddy and a golfer, and he um, led um, the Black Golfers Association um, here, and he had a lot to do with um, the golf tournaments in um, um, Douglas Park um, during the 40s and 50s. Um, he partnered with Kerry Jacobs, who owned Jacobs Brothers Funeral Home, um, that was in the 1200 block of MLK or West Street at that time. And he saved his home. So this brown, th these three houses actually are right to the east of the shopping center. Um, all the other houses got torn down. It was another house that um, was here that is no longer. So there were four homes that were saved in this block. And then the dump bar apartments were built. And it was a, a place where people who lived in the countryside would come and spend the winter because it had heat and plumbing. And you know, most rural people um, back in the 40s, 30s did not have plumbing or heat. Um, it also housed um, student um, teachers, um, addicts teachers as well. And um, it underwent um, a renovation in the early um, 2000s. And then it went uh, early um, 1990s, I'm sorry. And then it went underwent another renovation um, about 10 years ago. Um, and it's basically student housing now. The house, um, the tan house, that house um, was headquarters for the Sisters of Charities. And the Sisters of Charities was an organization that helped settle um, thousands of people who were part of the Great Migration. Um, Sisters of Charity was a statewide organization. And as the name suggests, it was run by women. Um, the last sister of charity died um, in the early 1990s, um, and the organization is no longer. Um, the yellow house in the middle, that house was home to the Cosmopolitan School of Music. Miss Lillian Lamone was the um, proprietor. Um, she was a music teacher over at Attic. She also um, was educated at IU in music. Um, she was um, a phenomenal woman. Um, she was the AKA. Um, she was um, very active with the Phyllis Wheatley Y. Um, and um, after Ms. Lamone died, um, one of her um, um, colleagues, Ms. Bertha Howard, um, bought that house and um, Ms. Howard was the children's choir director for Bethel. Um, she also had a restaurant in the back of her house um, that um, it was a separate building, but she fed um, addict students. It was, the, I was little at the time, but it was the place to go to, for your breakfast, for your lunch. Um, she taught voice, she taught piano, and she had Miss Lamone's grand piano in her, um, in the front parlor of that home. Um, I don't know what happened to that piano. Um, Miss Howard didn't have any children, and her sister, um, when Miss Howard died, um, her sister lived in the home, Miss Pansy, and um, she, unfortunately she was in a very bad car accident and she died. They were from Florida. Um, I actually took uh, music lessons, piano lessons with Miss Howard as did so many other people. Um, and um, I think I was probably one of her worst students. Um, she 
she was a very sweet woman, but I used to make her frustrated. She would say to me, don't you hear that note? Don't you hear that note? And, and I, evidently, I didn't hear that note right. But um, I'm sharing this to, to let you know, um, you know, the next time you drive past this block, just kind of think about um, the history that this block holds. And it also sim symbolizes um, how as a city, how we respect um, black history. Um, I'm sure if these houses and this apartment building was um, on Meridian Street, for instance, um, you would not have a roadway that looks the way that it does. Um, the um, street um, is basically a, a commuter roadway for um, people working at IEPY and, and at um, veterans at the hospitals. But the block definitely, um, it deserves more respect than, than what it gets. Um, I wanted to also share the Fall Creek YMCA. It's, it's a well-known um, building. I've been really surprised at how many different people have told me how much it hurt when we lost this building. Um, this was built as part of Project A. Um, it was built in the late 1950s, um, as you see. It um, has um, like mid-century um, um, detailing in it. The part where it says the YMCA was housing. So, you know, the single Y rooms. Um, the Y um, also um, was a center for the, for the entire community. Um, there was summer camps where we all learned how to swim. Um, there was um, activities for older people, um, groups met there. Um, it was just, um, it was, it's just a huge loss um, to, to not to have this building. And it had the best pool in the city, um, swimming pool. And, and to this day um, in this neighborhood, there are no um, recreational facilities at all. Um, the Y, was replaced by the Avenue Apartments. And on the left-hand side, um, that small sign that you see, that's the sign that the Buckingham Corporation decided was adequate to um, commemorate um, that beautiful Y um, MCA building. So it, it just makes me sad. Um, when, when I see this. And in the back um, on the photo on the left is the um, original um, city hospital, um, which was became Marion County General Hospital, then Wishart, and now it's Eskenazi. This is now owned by IEPY. And I'm very happy that they did not um, tear it down. Um, they tore down um, majority of the other buildings that consisted of Wishart, but they kept this original um, city hospital. Um, Flanner House, and, and most people know Flanner House. Um, you know, Flanner House um, is um, up in the um, near west side, um, near northwest side area, um, 25th and or 24th and MLK. But this is the Flanner House of my youth. Um, I was a Flanner House kid. Um, my mom said um, she put me in Flanner House. I was barely um, three um, because I decided that I was going to do her hair one day when she was asleep. And she woke up and all her hair was on the pillow. So she told me that next day she took me to nursery school. And I didn't realize at the time that um, Flanner House, um, this was a, a new building, um, maybe 10 years old, um, maybe 15 um, when, when I started. And um, we um, had all kinds of activities in this building. We had ballet, gymnastics, um, we did, had Spanish classes, we did our homework um, in, in this building. 
um, it was um, home um, for a, for a lot of um, a lot of people, um, and it was not only for black people. We also had white kids that um, went to um, Flannery House as well. Um, and on your left hand side, this is what Flannery House is today, <laughs> or the land that Flannery House stood on today is the. Um, um, neuroscience building, I want to say, but I don't think that that's right um, for um, Methodists. So um, when I was taking this picture, um, we were talking about just how unfriendly um, this building is. Um, and you it does not um, interact with the street at all. So, you know, you look at this beautiful um, mid-century um, Flanner House building, a community center, and then you, you see what has been replaced by. And um, I think um, behind the why, um, this is the second um, transformation that just kind of puts a hole in my heart um, just to see um, that it's gone. Um, another building that um, I wanted to share with you all is the Foster um, Motor Lodge. Um, when I was little, um, I remember we would go to this motor lodge because I would go with my uncle. There were always meetings and like Muhammad Ali, when he came to town, he stayed at the Foster Motor Lodge. It, it was the place, but it was a dark place. And you could go in from the back and you would go up in the stairs and it was all these people, all these grown people talking, doing, looking good. Um, and connected to it was um, Pearl's Lounge. It was a husband and wife um, that owned um, the uh, Motor Lodge and the, and the club, but you, anyone that's 60 or above, and you say Pearl's Lounge, they know Pearl's Lounge because Pearl's Lounge, again, was, it was like Foster's Motor Lodge where it was the place. Um, the building um, is still there and you, you drive past there now, it, 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 you know, it's just what it is. Um, but um, this was a, a good example of um, mid-century um, inoperatorship. I didn't say that right, um, inoperatorship. I'm still not saying that right. Um, uh, uh, in the Black community, um, the, and, and everybody supported this, um, this um, business. The next neighborhood um, that I wanted to talk about was Martindale. And as I mentioned before, um, Martindale is a historic neighborhood. It was um, settled in the 1870s. Um, it's seen some hard times, but it has very good people, people who love Martindale Brightwood, who are doing what they can do um, to make it a better community. Um, Frederick Douglass Park is um, gonna be celebrating its 100 year anniversary soon. Um, and I wanted to show um, just some pictures of the park. Um, the golf course um, was um, one of the best golf courses in the city um, when it was um, first opened um, and for years, and it's still um, in um, operation today. Um, you have um, the Douglas Pool, and what makes the Douglas Pool so special is, is that it was actually built in, um, and, and Douglas Park itself um, came to be um, because um, white people did not want black people hanging out in public spaces um, around town. Um, so um, land was donated um, for Douglas Park. Um, the golf course was built, you have a swimming pool, um, the family center um, is slated um, to be um, demolished and a brand new um, family center is gonna be built 
um, that process is being has started. But the Douglas Pool is really special because it um, was a place that was home to a lot of um, swimming contests. Um, Black people from all over the city um, would come and um, hang out at Douglas Pool at the park, barbecue, the kids would play in the pool. And um, it, it's a place where a lot of people learned how to swim. So I invite you to go and hang out at Douglas Park. It's a great place. Um, this is just another picture of the, the, um, oh, the gate to the park. I, I really like um, um, the way it feels when you're, you're standing there. Um, Norwood, um, this is the neighborhood that's on the Southeast side of town. Um, I um, wanted to share um, some information about um, Ms. Harris. Um, she was a remarkable person. Um, she um, moved to um, Norwood. She settled um, in Norwood. She cared for the neighborhood. She um, said that she wanted to see her people um, succeed. Um, so what she did was is um, when she died, um, she had property and she left it to the city um, for a park and a community center. Um, as you see, um, she invented um, the hair straightener, um, the flat iron at, that we know today. We all know about Madam Walker and um, her um, creams and gels, but um, Ms. Harris um, is not so well known, but I wanted to bring her contributions to light. Um, she was just a, a remarkable person. And um, Ms. Um, Tandy um, has done a wonderful um, presentation and a lot of research on, on Ms. Harris. So I invite you um, to reach out to her to learn more about um, Ms. Harris and her life. Um, this is my um, honor wall. Um, you know, we have a lot of people in our communities that are unsung heroes um, who are um, doing their best to um, make not only um, our lives better today, but also the lives of um, the future, people in the future. And um, I just wanted to um, really give, um, show some love um, to the Environmental Justice Collaborative of Martindale Brightwood. They've been working um, for decades on dealing with um, um, historical um, con contamination in their neighborhood. Um, Marndale um, was a, in, a, in a place where there was industry um, from the beginning. But what happened is, is that a company would come in and make all their money and they would leave and then they would leave all their um, chemicals and, and um, oils and lead and you name it um, for the community um, to deal with. And um, this Ms. Gore, Ms. Elizabeth Gore, who's the chair of the EJ Collaborative, and she has just worked tirelessly um, to, to not only clean up the contamination to make sure that it's cleaned up, but also um, to um, be a, a, a role model um, for um, the community, um, the Martindale Brightwood community. You know, as I mentioned before, we um, tend, when we talk about Martindale Brightwood, we tend to characterize it as a um, poor, crime ridden, drug infested place. But that's not, that's, that's not what Martindale Brightwood is. Martindale Brightwood is full of, um, people it, it, that you see who are educated, um, well-respected, um, and um, doing the best that they can do um, to elevate their community. Um, the photo in the middle 
is Miss Nancy Johnson. Um, unfortunately, um, we lost Miss Johnson um, last year at the age of 99, but she was just a, a little person with a huge heart. Um, she, her father, um, um, Holloman, Bill Holloman, was a um, musician um, on the avenue. He was blind, um, and um, she would um, she would talk about um, the beautiful house that they lived in on Bright Street, um, where now it's IUPUI's campus. And um, it was her and her sister. And her father worked um, for, um, I believe it's the Hartman Company. And um, Miss Nancy and her sister, who was married, who was married to Mr. Um, Thomas Ridley, who is well known um, as the uh, um, um, ambassador or the face of the Walker Building. Um, but Miss Nancy and her sister were able to attend Butler University um, in the um, 1940s. Um, they both graduated um, with degrees in education. Um, they were teachers. Um, Miss Nancy would say that um, grandkids of um, her students would come and um, tell her um, stories that they had heard from their grandparents or their parents. Sometimes she said she taught three generations of a family, but um, she, she is somebody who um, deserves recognition, not only for her um, career achievements, but also the fact that she loved everyone. And um, we, we just miss her in the neighborhood. Um, the, um, Next, the other picture to the at the top is the picture um, in front of the the um, Walker um, the Dunbar. I'm sorry, the Dunbar apartment building, and it's actually a picture of my mom. And um, I decided to include this because my mom represents um, the people here in Indianapolis who have basically given their lives. Um, for their um, the betterment of their children and their community. My mom worked at um, Wishard or Marion County General Hospital, whatever you want to call it, um, making pennies. Um, but she was able to buy her home. Um, she was able to make sure that I was educated, um, that I never wanted for anything. She was a person that... Um, refused to leave the neighborhood. And that's one reason that we have a ransom place today. People like my mom who said, I'm not going anywhere. This is my neighborhood, I'm gonna stay. And she stayed and um, I um, feel very proud um, that um, I can say that this, was, this is my mom. Um, the, the last picture is Miss Stevenson. And Miss Stevenson, um, she was born in Pat Ward's Bottoms. And um, she was, I remember her when I was little. Uh, she just passed last year, um, I want to say at the age of 90. Um, but she was a nurse. And she was just the sweetest woman um, that you ever wanted to meet. Um, she would make you laugh. Um, you know, she watched out for us as kids. And, you know, again, I just really wanted to just share with you um, just um, little tidbits about um, regular people who do not get any public accolades at all, that um, these are the people who have made um, our neighborhoods, what they are today in our city as well. Um, lastly, um, I just wanted to briefly talk about Reclaim at, um, Indiana Avenue. Um, the, it was um, last year, um, the Walker Board um, decided that it wanted to sell um, property 
um, that it owned um, is right now it's a parking lot and with a small office building on it. Um, and um, that um, kind of ignited um, not only me, but um, the entire black community here in Indianapolis um, to push back um, because that, that property was um, hard fought over um, in the um, 1980s, the city um, decided that um, it wanted to um, demo the entire um, Indiana Avenue. And um, there were groups of people that um, came forward and pushed back on that. Um, and if you notice on the south side of Indiana Avenue, you have um, newer buildings, save the Lockfield. Um, you have the nursing fraternity, you have um, parking lots, um, you have apartment buildings. But on the north side of um, Indiana Avenue from Michigan to 10th Street, um, those buildings, those, those structures are mainly uh, owned by um, um, nonprofits. And um, the reason being is, is that the group of people who came forth and pushed back, they were able to convince the city to um, sell those, the property to them. And the property was supposed to be for the benefit of the black community. Um, so um, when this proposal um, came forward, um, there were issues um, not only with um, the scale of the building, but there were also issues with the design. It was going to be a wall. It was also um, a wall that would kind of divide the neighborhoods from the university. It also was going to create a traffic nightmare. And it was just not appropriate for um, that particular parcel. So a, a group of people came together, um, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, came together and um, pushed back on this project. And we were successful, um, which is um, not too common um, these days um, in terms of pushing back on big, huge developments. And especially um, given the um, political nature of, of the Walker. Um, so um, looking forward, um, we're um, starting a, a area planning exercise that's gonna be um, community focused. Um, and the goal is, is to bring all of the residents and the stakeholders together. And that includes IEPY staff, students, administration, and it, it includes the city. Um, bring everybody, business owners, bring everybody together and plan for a, a collaborative vision for the future Indiana Avenue. Um, so um, I just briefly wanted to um, mention that. I also wanted to tell you that um, incorporated in this planning exercise, um, we're working with the Peace Learning Center and the Na Ransom Place Neighborhood Association um, to actually um, have a reconciliation. Um, we're going to employ um, a restorative um, model um, based on the wind garden circles. And this, this model was used in Rwanda. So if um, Rwandans can live um, side by side, given um, that genocide that happened, I have high hopes that this um, reconciliation project um, will be able to finally put the past behind us. Um, the university has not um, atoned for what happened. The university has not um, directly apologized to the people who were harmed. These people are in their 80s and their 70s, and they still carry the pain of um, what happened um, with the, the land grab, grab um, of the university. So um, my hope is, is that um, we'll be able to um, get past this and um, go forward um, for, you know, just a, a, a future um, 
for um, the city um, that is equitable and just. This justice is important, that's the goal. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I know how hard it is to read the comments while you're trying to make a presentation. So I have a, I have a couple of them here that I, I wanted to share with you. Um, Robin, appreciate your memory of your music teacher and wants you to know that everyone is not gifted in music. So <laughs> and Sharon uh, Freeland said that her friends, Olga Jefferson and Rex Kerr had their wedding reception in Pearl's Lounge in 1971. And uh, Alita Hodge said that Miss Nancy was her teacher at IPS and that she loved students and mentored everyone. So <laughs> Suzy, you, you touched a lot of people with your, uh, with your presentation this evening. Um, I have, a, there was one question that popped up. What neighborhood included California Street? Do you know oh, that's that? that's Ransom Place. That's Ransom, oh, Ransom Place. Place. But California actually extended south um, over across Indiana Avenue, um, IUPUI just vacated the street and now is the parking lot. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's, it was Ransom Place or, or um, actually uh, the near west side, but the, <laughs> the near west across the river. I came back home and uh, the near west was across the river, but we used to be the near west side over here. Um, and, and that's really kind of symbolic of um, the, the shrinkage of the area, right? Um, before it was um, from um, Washington, the 16th, the capital, the White River. And now when you think of the neighborhoods, you're really just thinking of Indiana Avenue, the 10th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, where can we find more information about the neighborhoods? Where would you recommend somebody look? There's a lot of research and, and, and a lot of study that's going on now. Um, I would actually um, advise people to um, Google, <laughs> kind of Google um, Ransom Place. Um, there's... Um, dissertations that's been written that are interesting. Um, Jordan Ryan the, and Paul Mullins, um, they do wonderful work um, talking about the neighborhood. Paul Mullins has a um, blog called uh, Invisible Indianapolis. And um, if it was not for him, um, I, I really think that um, a lot of the interests would not be here in the neighborhood because he over his 20 years of studying the neighborhood, he's put a human face on people. And, you know, that's kind of been hard um, for black people. We're not necessarily um, um, thought of um, in, in those terms and, and that's being played out as you see um, nationally, um, but he's been great. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Historical Society has great co um, collection as well, IUPUI, um, um, last year they um, initiated a diversity um, project. And um, so there's gonna be more information coming out um, from the university. Okay. Um, how can people get involved to save what remains of historic neighborhoods in Indianapolis? Well, you know, actually um, there's a lot of people who are um, work hard to, um, to save what we have. Um, I think um, it's more important to think about some of the other neighborhoods that we may not think of as being historic. So for instance, Martindale Brightwood, um, there's a um, second um, um, Flannery House Homes project there in Oak Hill. Um, Martindale Brightwood would love for people to move into the neighborhood. Um, um, and, and not come in and tear down the houses, but come in, um, renovate the homes. Um, uh, also, West Indianapolis is another um, historic neighborhood that um, could use uplifting. Riverside is another neighborhood. So it's, it's really more of um, not so much um, joining a group, but it's more, more 
I think of just respecting the people who are there. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah. Respecting what they bring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Deborah wanted to know, um, what role is the city playing in um, the reconciliation? Um, they're supportive. Are they supportive? Okay. Yeah, they're supportive. Um, I must say, um, this last administration has um, it's been surprising, but they've been really um, supportive. Last year, Jeff Bennett actually um, said publicly he apologized for the city's role. That was the first time the city had actually acknowledged their role in the um, the demolition of, of so many structures in the neighborhood and, and, and the policies um, that um, supported that. Um, okay. Someone asked, I saw a question that came up. Somebody asked about um, Miss Nancy on the Hooney website. Mm -hmm. um, we did a um, interview with Miss Nancy um, so they can go to Hooney, um, Indy, org and um, listen to the interview that we did with her. Okay, okay. So you are you're so passionate um, about these neighborhoods. If someone um, wanted to research their own neighborhood, wherever it is, what advice would you have for them? To sign up for the, <laughs> the people's <laughs> the people's planning academy. Um, that like tonight, um, Friday's the last sign up. Um, the, cut off, but there's actually going to be a course there on training people or teaching people how to research their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, also on the HUNY website, um, there's information about that. Um, there's a lot of information, um, which I'm happy about, about the history of various neighborhoods that's kind of floating around, even the Marion County um, Library, the Hallville branch, for instance, Mm -hmm. um, in their conference room, there's a beautiful, beautiful um, ex exhibition of the history of Hallville um, that's in that conference room. So, you know, it's not always um, it's inaccessible, this type of information. Okay. Um, and so two questions then kind of uh, as we wrap this up, and I think that I've asked everybody that has been part of this series. Um, what do you wish you had a photo of? Um, I wish I had a photo, a great photo of the Wheatley Y. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of good photos. I've only seen like one photo and it's always the same photo. But mm -hmm. I remember going in there and it was after the Y had moved. So it was the mistake the Masons were there, the Masonic Hall were there and they would come out um, on West Street and have parades and all dressed in their finery. But there was a, um, a swimming pool in there, an <laughs> indoor swimming pool in there. And I just um, wish I had a, mem a, a really good photo of that building. And, and, and Phyllis Wheatley, is, is another hero of mine. And there's um, several Phyllis Wheatley wives in the country, you know, um, and I, I just wish we we had more respect for that building before it, it burned down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Paula, we really appreciate your presentation and we really appreciate your taking the time to, to be a part of our Historic Neighborhood Series. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll hope that you'll come back and maybe do a program for us again. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Have a great evening.